because, you know, all my prognostics say that you must, and you will do that, and there will be lots of bad, you know, medical decisions being made, and, and, so, and so on and so forth. Medical, you know, uh, think about journalism, you know, the, all the you know, sort of data-oriented articles that you read where people have culled through the literature and found things at uncontrolled error rates and published them as if they were the truth. Um, so, that, you know, I could go on and on about this, but I think that we're facing a crisis uh, until we get to be doing the science and engineering correctly of big data systems. All right, that's, that's what I want to do. Now, of course, it even gets worse because uh, this is out in the real world. This isn't just in an academic lab. All this data is owned by somebody, and there are people who have privacy concerns, and there's all kinds of externalities, you know, economic issues surrounding this data. And you've got to get all that right, too. Those are real constraints on the real world problem. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about privacy as an example, but it's a, it'll stand in for many, many other such examples. Um, all right, so doing all those things, we just can't do that right now. So all, you, know, you may read about all the big data revolution systems and all the big conferences and all. We can't meet these challenges right now. And it's, done, it's being done in a very, very ad hoc way that will often fail. Um, all right, so as a young person in the room, you might, I hope you'll rise to the challenge. This is what the next 20 to 50 years of work is going to be, you know, on the theoretical level as well as the systems building level, we'll need to face. All right, um, let me continue to dig into this issue a little bit more. So why is this so hard? Uh, why can't we just kind of glue together our existing systems and with the machine learning technology and all? Well, because really the underlying theoretical issues haven't really been ever faced. Um, so, you know, statistical theory at the core, uh, there's something called statistical decision theory, and it unifies great you know, swaths of statistics. Um, it comes out of game theory, von Neumann, uh, as, at the, as at the core of all this. Um, and it refers to uh, lots of important concepts. Uh, you know, there's a notion of risk, there's a notion of loss, there's a number of, number of amount of data, there's a notion of complexity of hypotheses, and there's equations that relate to all these. And they're usually big O or little O or something like that. They're, they're you know, beautiful theory, uh, and, and they also lead to engineering, uh, you know, useful engineering. Nowhere in that sequence of, of, um, of symbols or equations will you find runtime. Now, you can't trade off with all those quantities, how long it's going to take to run, or how many machines. None of the kind of computational resources are in statistical decision theory, and they're not easy to glue in. Okay? Um, kind of Turing's approach to, uh, you know, complexity is not glue well, um, the number of tapes you have on a machine and so on, into statistical decision theory. Um, all right, so that's a bit of a problem. Now, on the other hand, there is core, you know, Turing-style computational complexity theory, and it's got all kinds of other quantities, resources, time and space and energy and so on, and there are beautiful equations that relate all of them, you know, n log n, n squared, and so on and so forth. Nowhere in those equations will you find risk, the statistician's thing that quantifies how good the resource of data is. Now, this is a bit of an exaggeration. You, you see it leaking in from time to time, but it's definitely not in the core. You won't pick up a complexity theory book and see losses and expectations over losses, i.e. risk. You can't optimize it. You can't trade it off against all your other resources. All right, so that's the reason we can't just easily do this, because we don't have the underlying mental machinery to build systems. We don't have a theory. All right, so we've got to start working on this. Um, even more stereotypically, but sort of trying to really drive this point home, you know, in computer science, we often say a problem is solved once we know whether it's polynomial time or not. Um, and for applications of big data, that's just not the regime that matters. The regime is linear and sublinear. That's where the theory is all needed, and we've got to get there. You know, there is work there, but um, there needs to be a lot more. In statistics, we say a problem is solved once we can say words like consistent or asymptotically efficient. All right? But to get those sort of things to happen, we have to make all kinds of assumptions uh, that are rarely true in the big data regime. Okay? So we need a brand new theory that really will apply to the kind of data we're seeing now. All right, so I hope I've now made my kind of prejudices clear. Um, so why should this be attractive viewed as possible? Why, why should we be setting out on this adventure to try to, build, to make a new theory and to build new systems? Uh, well, first of all, in computer science, there's been a, a, a long heritage of thinking a lot about worst case results, you know, from the heritage of Turing. Um, and so uh, some of the kind of machinery we'll talk about today, there, is, there are results, but there are worst case approximation ratios across some geometric entity. It's not a statistical entity. Right? And you will get rates according to that worst case ratio. And that's not the regime that we're interested in if we're trying to do statistical inference. And that we'll get very different results, as you'll see, when we go to the statistical perspective. Um, so there's no such need for exactitude. In machine learning, people do tend to appreciate this, that you don't have to get optimized out to the 50th decimal place. All right? But op um, machine learning people tend to optimize without thinking about uncertainty and error bars very much. And so this whole message of you don't need to optimize to the, you know, the cows come home is sort of lost because people there aren't thinking too much about confidence intervals, kind of the statistician's uh, bread and butter. Um, another reason there's hope is that 
Laws of large numbers and concentration theorems are everywhere in analysis, um, especially these days. Uh, and they help analysts sort of analyze that algorithms are doing well and behaving well and, 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 and bad things can't happen. Um, but they also have implications for the design of algorithms. If you know that some quantity is concentrated, um, that means you don't have to calculate it. You can already plug in the fact that it's calculated and, and avoid having the algorithmic steps that you go through to, to actually calculate a result that you might know in advance if you do some theory. So this is also dimly um, perceived in the literature, but not nearly as much as it should be. Um, and then lastly, probably the easiest one to sort of make hay out of is that parallel computing, you know, is the one knob we can turn to give ourselves a abundant computational resource. And it also has statistical consequences because it is easy often to divide up statistical problems into pieces, uh, you know, multiple data sets and so on and so forth. So this is probably the area of most activity here. And um, here, here are some of the areas where you'll see a lot of activity. All right, so that's some um, of the background of what I've been working on for about 10 years now. And I'm going to use the rest of my time to give you some vignettes to give a little flavor of the kind of results. These are, in some sense, thought experiments that try to bridge all the way from theory, do something new in the theoretical sphere, but also try to uh, aim at applications and, and real world systems. Um, so, one general perspective that we've been adopting and doing this line of work. Um, is to take statistical decision theory as the uh, point of departure. We're going to have a one foot solidly in that. That gives you control, tells you about the loss function, the utilities that individuals may have for analyzing data, and it gives you a notion of risk, of uncertainty together with loss. And we're going to make guarantees on the risk. We're going to say, you want a 5% error rate? I will guarantee that. I will do the analysis and develop the system that will guarantee that. And then given that as a hard constraint, we'll add in other constraints, like it must run fast, it must respect privacy, it must be communication efficient, and all those things. That's kind of backwards for what machine learning is typically done, which is to build systems that are guaranteed to run fast. They can write down an algorithm, and it has a certain run time, so you're done on that, and make it even faster as the year goes on, but hope it'll give a good result. And then show empirically that it does, and it beats other results, but not have an actual grounding for making that assertion um, a priori. Um, so anyway, that's what we're gonna do, we're gonna add some of these externalities as uh, constraints in a statistical decision theory framework and see if we can get actual equations, kind of theoreticians' equations, uh, that are, uh, yield rules of thumb. Okay, so here is some of the things, this is not really an outline, these are some of the things I've been working on with various colleagues, and I mainly show this to show some names of colleagues at this point. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about privacy and communication, and then, and then I will dip, dip, dip my toe a little bit into these later things on computational constraints, which I've been emphasizing, and then on parallel and distributed computing. Um, and uh, you know, m move on. So a um, little bit of background just to make sure we're all on the same page as we get started. Um, you know, I should have probably, I put Wald up here in the 30s, Wald developed this theory. He was uh, kind of a blend of a statistician and an econometrician or economics, uh, ec economist. Um, but he built his work on von Neumann um, and they, they of course knew each other and uh, that, that was where this influence comes from. Um, all right, so this theory to me is still to this day the, the theory underlying sort of almost all of statistics, everything I can think of, Bayesian and frequency alike, and all of machine learning, which I think of as a bunch of topics inside of statistics, not a different field. Um, so what is it? Let's just be put on a little bit of notation here. Uh, we're going to have a family of distributions P, script P, and there's a particular distribution, little P, NP, that is the underlying truth, it's nature. And we're trying to infer some aspect of that, maybe some predictive quantity, maybe some literal classical parameter, um, some aspect, some functional on that uh, underlying truth that we don't know, P. All right, um, now we're gonna have a com computational procedure, an estimator, uh, whose job it is to take in actual data and make a prediction um, for what that underlying parameter, theta of P, will be. Then we're gonna compare how well we did with a loss function of some kind. And we'll let the user have creativity and say what kind of loss do they care about? And um, you wanna open up to, you know, it could be a ranking loss, it could be a combinatorial loss of some kind. It's not just least squares. It, it's, uh, you know, the whole game here is to be very much more broad. So um, most statisticians at this point would be perfectly happy that we have all the ingredients of a statistical problem at this, at this point. Um, all right, now you've got a problem, which is that neither theta hat is known because the data is random, and nor is theta, of course, known because you don't know the underlying uh, uh, you know, P. So this is not just, a, it's not a number that you can use to compare procedures. It's, it's a functional of two arguments. Okay, so now statistics branches. Either you take an expectation over the first argument, the theta hat, or you take an expectation over the second argument, the theta, and that's called frequentist and Bayesian. And that's why there are two approaches to statistics, because the loss function has two arguments. 
Um, all right, so today we're going to be frequentist. And the frequentist will take an expectation under the underlying generation of the data, P, where this object is random because the data X, which I've suppressed here, is coming from P. All right, so this is a function of P now. We, we fixed the P and we took the expectation. And moreover, there is the same P right here. P appears in two places here. So this resulting object, the risk function, is a function of P. And of course, it's a function of the particular procedure theta hat that you're, you're investigating. Um, all right, so Wald you know, wrote this down and recognized there's a bit of a problem, which is that I got it down now. It's not a functional two arguments that are random. It's now just a function, a literal classical function of one argument, P. All right, but I still can't compare you know, my theta hat versus Soren's theta hat. All right, I can get the risk function for him and the risk function for me, but they might cross. All right, so I don't know which is better. So you'd like to get this down to a single number for him and a single number for me. Now at this point, statistics gets even more challenging, and what Wald did, to, which still lives to this day, is to say, let's look at the worst case. So a little bit of worst case thinking comes into statistics. That's not worst case, that's average. But here we got worst case. Let's take the worst P over the family and define that as the maximum risk. And then we will try to minimize the maximum risk, which is the Minimax principle, which again, von Neumann's name is associated with in the very beginning. So let's try to do this in a new setting. That was very classical. Uh, let's try to do this in a setting where we're trying to bring in privacy as a constraint on our procedure. So theta hat is going to be a good statistical procedure, and it also is going to respect privacy. And do that in a quantifiable way where you can get actual trade-offs. Um, by the way, this is work with uh, John Ducci and Martin Wainwright, uh, colleagues of mine at Berkeley, and John's now at Stanford. Um, here's the setup. We're going to have data. I guess I can walk over here and point. So uh, data x1 through xn is held by n individuals, and they want to keep their data at least somewhat private. So they're going to send the data to a channel, q, which outputs z based on x. There's a little kernel there that outputs z. And then the statistician living at Google um, can take the z's and do, do the data analysis. All right, and we're going to set up the channel so that it protects privacy to some level. All right, so the, the spirit of this is that you want to have a knob you can turn as each individual. If you want to have my genome, for example, that's xi for me, um, then I'm going to ask you, well, what's your loss function? Are you trying to work on a disease that runs in my family? Then, yeah, I'll, I'll give you my data. Um, are you trying to sell me something, or are you trying to set my insurance rate? Well, no, I, I don't want to give you my data. I want to dial that, that down a little bit. I have more privacy in that situation. So I want a number that I can dial between zero and infinity that gives me a notion of protecting my privacy. Okay? Um, and then given that number, then I want to do as good as I can in statistical inference. All right, so there is, of course, a literature on privacy where people have uh, defined a notion of privacy. And the one that we have used that's become, I think, this more or less the standard is called differential privacy. It's developed in the database and cryptography literatures. Um, and uh, it has been used for what I would call a non-inferential set of problems, mostly. Not, this is not entirely true, but mostly. So you have a database, uh, bank accounts with everybody's name and, and, and money, all right? That's, a, that's the database. And I want to run a query on that, you know, find what's the maximal, um, you know, account uh, balance or whatever, all right? Now that database is huge, so, um, and more of I want to protect privacy, so I'm not going to let you have access to the full data itself. I'm going to fuzz up the data in a certain way to protect privacy and then give you the fuzzed up data and you'll run the query on the fuzzed up data. You'll get an answer which is of course different from the one you'd run on the true data and I want to bound the error by epsilon. Okay, so I want to ensure you get an almost correct answer to the query while protecting people's privacy. All right, so that's not inferential in the, in the following sense. What if the data were, um, uh, I got it out of data, uh, someone who's not in the actual bank to come in, right? So in the, in the bank account example, it's not very interesting, but think about a medical example. So now the data is um, you know, various medical measures on various people and then, and then how well they responded to a drug, okay? Um, now I'm gonna also wanna protect the privacy of these people, um, but at the same time, these people are all turned out to be dead. Is that still useful data? From the bank account example, probably not. But here, yeah, because I still have new people coming in who are like the people in the database and I wanna predict how well they're gonna respond to the drug. So I'm gonna still use the data, but I still wanna protect the people in the data because they still have families and so on. So that's an inferential problem. You get a new person like the people in the original data and still trying to do good inference while protecting privacy of the observed data. Okay. All right, so how do you do all that? Uh, well, we're gonna start with differential privacy, which is a story about the channel. There's no P in here. This is a story just about the channel. Uh, it says, given a database X, say it's data with, uh, with me not in the data, and then X prime is the same data but with me in the data. All right, we're going to look at the output of the channel for some particular event S, and let's think of an adversary picking an event which reveals the most about whether X, X or X prime. 
And we look at that ratio and try to control that ratio. We'll take a supremum over all data pairs of databases and over all events the adversary could look at and try to keep that small. So we have a band around this likelihood ratio here. And we have this now tunable knob alpha, which allows us to um, quantify the discriminability among the queries based on the channel outputs based on databases X or X prime. Okay, so uh, there we go. There's our definition now. We have a notion of a channel being alpha differentially private. So let's put that into statistics. So here's what we're going to do. Um, uh, we are going to, first of all, let's go to, let me uh, blank out this. This is the maximum risk we talked about before, the, ma the worst case over the expectation of the loss function. Now, in statistics, you would then take the infimum over that to get the minimax risk, the procedure which minimizes the maximal risk. And all we're going to do to add in this externality is we're going to add another infimum over all channels which respect differential privacy at level alpha. Okay? Because we get to choose the channel that respects, still respects the constraint, but also makes inference as good as possible. So we're going to take an infimum over the, the statistical quantity, which is the risk. And now the whole question is, can we do mathematics on this kind of object? Uh, of course, it's a function of number of data points in. It's also a function of the dimension of the space and, and, and various other parameters of the family. Um, can we get equations that relate all those quantities by solving this optimization problem? Okay, so let's see that we can. Um, here's a little example. Um, let's suppose we have people coming into uh, hospitals and they've been abusing substances. So here's a person that abuses alcohol and cocaine and doesn't abuse other substances. Um, let's suppose these are the underlying parameters in the population I'd like to infer. So, you know, 45% of the people abuse alcohol and 32% about abuse cocaine. If I knew these numbers, I could build the right number of hospitals, I could have the right number of doctors, I could do public policy. So I'd like to know those numbers. Of course, if I just had data like that, I'd do maximum likelihood, get the sample proportions based on that, and that would be maximum likelihood estimates of those parameters. But of course, people don't want to give this kind of data. All right, so what do you do? Well, hopefully you don't get the lawyers involved, hopefully you start to get statisticians involved. <laughs> All right, so here we're gonna set this up mathematically. We're gonna, the, the parameter to be estimated is just, of course, the, the mean, that, that's what those thetas are, and it's d-dimensional. Let's let it be d-dimensional. Um, let's look at a non-parametric situation where the family is all those supported on a compact set. Here's the classical minimax rate for this, okay? So I'm sure Stu and others here teach this sort of thing. Um, it's one over the square root of the number of data points. That's the so-called non-parametric rate, and it's beautifully logarithm of the dimensionality of the space. So it's, it's kind of a high dimensional, it works pretty well in high dimension. Uh, so that's a lower bound than it's achieved by a particular estimator, and that's very, very classical. All right, now what happens when I in, in, in impose this new constraint and do this extra infimum? Do I get alpha appearing in this equation in some way? And the answer is, yeah, you do. Um, so here it is. Alpha appears right down here. Okay, so um, that's kind of nice. It's in a very appealing place. It, it kind of looks like an effective sample size now. If someone says alpha is near one, I don't care about my privacy at all. All right, then alpha squared is still kind of near one. You get basically the same bang for your buck. The same amount of data will give you the same risk. If someone turns down their knob near to, z, you know, no, let's say 0.5, um, then that's 0.25, and now I gotta get four times as much data to get the same risk as I would have gotten before. But that's fine, you told me in advance your alpha is gonna be small. I say, okay, I got it. I'm gonna just get collect more data to make sure I get the risk I care about so I can do public policy. All right, so that's exactly the kind of thing that we want. We want a little equation like that that is mathematically true and leads, leads to practical, you know, solutions. Now, problematically, that log D went to D log D. Okay, um, and so what's going on here is that in high dimensions, this is not particularly uh, favorable. Uh, differential privacy, protecting in all directions in high dimensional spaces is, is hard. And, uh, and so I think the one way to think about this is that it kind of shows a weakness of differential privacy. It's, a very it's too strong, okay? It's too hard to protect privacy in all directions. So you need to be kind of willing to project privacy in some directions and not others. And there's gotta be new research needed on uh, statistically appropriate differential privacy that's, that's less strong, but still uh, achieves desirable privacy and good minimax rates. Okay, um, now, uh, does this lead to actual new procedures? Um, so that's a lower bounding argument that gives, says here's the best, here's an equation that says how good you can do. Um, you know, does this theory lead to anything new? And so the answer is kind of yes. Uh, so here's um, an example, of, again, of this same uh, alcohol cocaine situation. Here's someone's data. They don't want to reveal that. And so they're going to fuzz it up in some way. And the first thing you would do if you look at the literature on differential privacy is you'd add Laplace noise. W1 through W5 are drawn from a Laplace distribution, heavy-tailed noise, <coughs> and fuzz up the data and get Z. All right? That's guaranteed to protect differential privacy at level alpha. That's proved in that literature, and you, you can prove it yourself. 
Um, uh, the Gaussian noise it will not protect privacy. It's too, uh, the, the, the light tails don't give you privacy protection. Um, now, if you put it into this, this theory, the statistical theory, uh, you will learn that that mechanism uh, is, is, does not meet the lower bound. In fact, it's quite suboptimal. Okay? So it seems like an okay mechanism. It does respect privacy, but it gives you bad statistical inference. It's fuzzing the data up too much. So is there a better mechanism that actually doesn't fuzz up the data quite as much and still protects privacy? So here it is. Um, there is such a mechanism. Uh, so here's my original data. What I'm going to do is define a random bit vector, v. And then, of course, 1 minus v is just the complement of that. Um, and now, given the actual data, the user will transmit to the statistician either v or 1 minus v. And the user will transmit the closer of v and 1 minus v to the true data. And they'll do that with a probability that depends on alpha. And that equation should come up here in a minute. Here it goes. So with probability e to the alpha over 1 plus e to the alpha, you'll transmit the closer of v and 1 minus v to the statistician, otherwise transmit the other one. All right, so that seems like a perfectly fine ad hoc mechanism. <laughs> You're, there's some mutual information here. You are giving them some information about the data, but it seems pretty bad. It's a random bit vector, and it's some, pr some probability you're transmitting that. All right, but surprisingly, th that's, that's actually optimal. Okay, it, pr it still protects privacy at level alpha, and it's optimal from a statistical point of view. All right, now, it actually isn't new. This, was, uh, this particular mechanism was proposed in the 60s by Warner. It's a known mechanism. He just didn't have a theory to say that it was actually an optimal mechanism under some theory. Um, all right, so there you go. There's a mechanism. And actually, does it matter in real life? Here's real data. This is uh, from the Drug Abuse Warning Network. Um, 60,000 people, L infinity error. The um, Laplace mechanism is here, and the uh, Warner mechanism I is here. So on a log scale, it's really, really a significant difference. I, I would not use Laplace noise for this particular problem. Okay, so to um, finish up, let me just kind of, I think I'm going to skip this slide up for one of time. Um, let me, here we go. Uh, let, me, let me just say for the experts in the audience a little bit what's going on here. So to get lower bounds in statistics, you know, you're on this P space, which is a you know, continuous large dimensional space and you want a lower bound for performance on that entire space. Well, to get a lower bound, with the, the standard you know, attack going back, this probably doesn't go back to von Neumann, but you know, certainly back 40 years in information theory literature, is to, is, is to take a grid on the space. And now given the truth is one grid point, you want to say, what's the probability I return to you a different grid point? And that's now a hypothesis testing problem. And you can get kolbeck liebler divergence kind of errors, large <coughs> deconation errors of the probability of making that kind of error and then sum that over the grid and you get a lower bound than your original problem. And now you take those kolbeck liebler divergence and you ask, can you bound those? And that's kind of Fano's inequality and there's a whole technology around this. So what's happening new here is that you don't have access to the original data. You can't do Fano on the original data. So the original data is coming from P and you have grid points on the original space. Well, we put this and convolve it through a channel. And so the actual distributions that we can work with as theoreticians are these things M, these marginal distributions under the output of a channel. All right, and what's happened is, is that when you did that convolution, things spread, and you get more errors because there's less discriminability because of the spread. All right, and so is there a relationship now between the kolbeck liebler divergences on these m quantities that you know you're trying to bound, and the original p's? And this little data processing inequality is something that we developed, which is exactly that. And so you see that um, the, the the p's and the m's are related by a quantity which has n, and then this little quantity that involves actual alpha. There's where alpha is occurring. And if you do a little Taylor expansion here, uh, you know, the one cancels the minus one, uh, you just get alpha squared. So n alpha squared is coming out. And so that gives you a, a hint why this should be not just, this should be a general result. Uh, it doesn't tell you about the dimension dependence, but it tells you about where alpha appears in the this, in this statistical analysis. It's right in this kind of data processing inequality. All right, now this happens in problem after problem. So um, here's a bunch of the ones we've analyzed. And uh, in problem after problem, the effective sample size goes from n to n, multiplies in alpha squared, and you divide by d. So that's kind of differential privacy meets statistics in a nutshell. One equation for a lot of, a lot of problems. Okay, let me move on. Um, the next, I have two little more vignettes. They'll be quicker than that, um, but they have a similar flavor. Or at least the first one does. Um, so let's now think about bringing Shannon into contact with, uh, with uh, statistics. You know, so Shannon, uh, you know, lower bounds, you know, there's, there is contact, but um, you know, Shannon theory is not statistical. It's, it uses probabilities, but it's not inferential. Um, so let's set up a problem that is of a Shannon flavor and turn it into an inferential problem. So here's one. Um, let's have distributed data, x1 through xm. Maybe these are different hospitals or different, you know, uh, maybe there's so much data, you have terabytes in each of m sites that you can't transmit all the data to a central site. So this problem has been studied. It's called the CEO problem. Um, 
Um, so what you need to do is compress the data down to a rep representative VM, and then the compressed data you can transmit to a central site. Right, now, if you just do kind of Shannon theory, you know, you would compress in a particular way, you know, uh, with entropy criteria, but that's not necessarily what a statistician, that's not going to give you good statistical risk. That's not a, that's one mechanism, but it's probably not the best one. Um, so can we, can we get a theory that allows us to say which one might be better? So let's look at, um, again, the statistical decision theory setup. Uh, we are going to have, again, the same kind of family here. We're going to work with the L2 loss just for so I can give you some results. And here's, again, our friend, the minimax risk, okay? So the minimum of the maximum risk across, in this case, a L2 loss function. And what we're going to add now is that we're going to take an infimum over all compression protocols that have a bit rate B. And the bit rate is on that channel right there, okay? So I can't see more than B bits over that channel, so I have to respect that, and I have to compress it down to B bits and still do good statistics under that constraint. So we add it as a constraint, and we choose, we get to design the channel, so we choose the best one, uh, the infimum of the risk. All right, um, so let's look at an example. Um, here we have, we're just trying to infer the mean of a big Gaussian, d-dimensional Gaussian, and we have the data spread over m servers. All right, um, so theta is our d-dimensional parameter we'd like to infer. The classical minimax rate for inferring the mean of a Gaussian uh, on a compact set goes as one over the total number of data. Each machine, there's m machines, has n little n data points, so that's the total amount of data. One divided by that is the classical minimax rate. What happens now when you add the B, uh, uh, when you do the math on that same thing with the constraint over B, does B appear in this equation somehow? Um, the answer is it does. Um, here, to, and so there's a lower bound and an upper bound now. Here's the one that I care about. Um, so here's the classical minimax rate, and here's a new equation, new part of the equation, which has log of the uh, number of machines. That's very favorable. You can have lots of machines, and it's not going to hurt you. Uh, and then divided by one over the, the minimum of B and D. D is the dimension of the problem, the dimension of the Gaussian, and B is the bit rate. If you <laughs> set B, you choose your bit rate to be equal to D, then that becomes a D and that cancels. So that's really interesting. This, this, we didn't have any reason to expect this to happen, but the, the bit rate of communication is related in a very interesting and strong way to the dimension of the statistical inference problem. Those seem to be completely different quantities but this equation says that they're actually uh, related. So I, th I think that's, we haven't been following that up recently, but I, I want to return to that. I think it's really, really interesting. Okay, so I think I'm going to uh, move on. That's all I wanted to say about sort of the um, compression problem. Again, um, you know, hopefully this will seem somewhat new. It's just, you know, usually an information theory talk, uh, the statistical objectives are not kind of part and parcel of designing the communication protocol, and, 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 and that's what we're doing here. Okay, last part of the talk. Um, so, uh, as I alluded to in the earlier part of the talk, to me, the really exciting issues are on the interface between computational resources like time and space and number of machines and those sorts of things, and the statistical inference issues, which have to do with error rates and all these sort of things. So we kind of have skirted all that. We've done privacy and, and communication and somehow easier problems. So let's try to now get towards this core challenge. Let me just say a priori that I'm, we're not going to solve this part. This is, this is the hard part. Um, you know, this is going to need generations of work and someone in the room, you know, we're going to need our Einstein or our von Neumann or whatever to sort of step up. This is, the, this is where it gets hard. Um, and it's just kind of hard for a lot of reasons, you know, again, Turing's theory, very worst case oriented. Also, there's kind of, multi there's machine constants, you know, if I have a one tape machine versus two, I have different constants, and those matter for the statistical inference problem. They don't matter for classical complexity theory, but they matter here. So it really becomes quite challenging. The, the absence of lots of lower bounds in computational science also will matter to us. Um, you know, so we're going to have to kind of get at this, and maybe let's, let's be honest and say a little bit more of an ad hoc or vignette kind of style. Let's try out new ideas and see where they go and hope a theory will emerge. I don't think we're going to, at least I'm not going to be able to write down an, a, a theory from the beginning. Let me just say before I get into a little bit of that more, say, let's call it ad hoc um, arguments, um, that there is ongoing work at the exponent, you know, the NP, P and NP barrier that is statistical, statistical relevance. And I, you know, a lot of people are very interested by this. I just want to allude to it. To me, it's not the core problem because, again, as I alluded to earlier, we should be down at sublinear, not exponential and polynomial. Um, but there's a very nice line of work, and it started with a paper, at least to my mind, uh, by Berthe and Rigolet in 2013. Um, you're looking at the statistical error rate you can achieve for different classes of algorithms. So if I am too ambitious for a certain, for certain problems, asking for a really small error rate, it's not going to be possible to achieve that, and you could prove that for, for these, these problems. And there is a barrier at which it becomes possible to solve the problem, um, you know, but you, you're going to pay an exponential cost to solve it. OK, 
Okay, the only algorithms known to get that error rate are actually exponential. And there becomes then, of course, under classical uh, complexity theory assumptions, another barrier where you'll pass into a little bit, into a, a little bit friendlier regime where to, to achieve that error rate, there are known polynomial time algorithms that'll achieve it. Okay, so this gap between what you can achieve between polynomial and exponential, you know, is, is interesting. Uh, so it was done for, um, you know, a somewhat, a somewhat exotic problem, sparse PCA detection in that paper. And it's become less exotic as time has gone on. And this latest paper is with uh, uh, Yu Shen Zhang and Martin Wainwright and myself just appeared is for the kind of least exotic of all problems, just sparse linear regression. So it turns out in that problem also there is this gap. So um, mathematically, these things are very interesting. Um, again, to me, it's not the whole problem, certainly, and, and it may not be the most important part of the problem, but at least it is good progress is being made. Um, okay, so here's some of the things that uh, my group and I have been working on for about 10 years now, and, and I, I, it's not maybe called them ad hoc, but you know, just attempts. Um, you know, so the one I think I will tell you about in, la in the last part of the talk is convex relaxations as a way to relate geometry to statistics and geometry to computation. Geometry, in fact, is an intermediate in a lot of the arguments, not in only in our work, but in many others. Um, I won't talk about concurrency control, but you know, I noticed some database people in the room. To me, that's one of their great achievements is a whole theory of concurrency control for very large scale problems. And I think it, it can and has been usefully applied to statistical inference problems. If you think about distributed statistical inference, you can bring concurrency control ideas to bear. That's a different talk. Um, optimization, if you've been following our field at all, you'll know, in fact, the most significant progress on computational meet statistics issues have been met when the computation part of the equation is, is using ideas from optimization theory, in particular the notion of oracles. If I've seen a gradient a certain number of times, then I can tell you what's the best you can, I can give a lower bound on the best you can possibly do. And this is kind of the Russians, like Nesterov has developed this theory, and it's very, very productive for people in my field as well. Um, and I won't talk about this at all, and then I won't talk about subsampling. Maybe just sort of allude to, um, you know, if you have huge amounts of data, the natural thing to do is to try to look at small subsamples of it. And in a computer science sort of sense, that makes a lot of sense. You know, in, um, if I have a continuous optimization problem and I, and I subsample, I should be just, I should be off by a little bit. There should be some continuity. But in statistics, that's not the case. Uh, error bars go as one over the square root of the amount of data, typically, classically. So, um, and so if I subsample by a factor of 10, my error bars, bars will be off by a factor of square root of 10. They'll just be totally wrong. All right, so uh, there is a kind of a conflict between subsampling and statistics, which is very interesting to try to get around, and, and that's another talk. Okay, so let me turn to the last part of the talk um, with my colleague Venkat Chandrasekharan, where we have tried to use geometry as an intermediate between statistics and computation. Um, and this is really just, again, a kind of a thought experiment to show you what a theory might look like that relates, in, you know, in some sense, computation with statistics. Um, so uh, let's do, let's set up the thought experiment with a, a real thought experiment. So here's a little diagram that has on one axis a uh, statistics quantity, the number of samples, something that a statistician cares about a lot. And on the other axis, runtime, something a computer scientist cares about a lot. Um, and now to glue these together, I'm going to need one other quantity that really, you know, mathematical quantity that glues them together. I'm going to need the risk. So we, we have notion of a three-dimensional surface now that has risk, runtime, and an amount of data. Um, and the way we end up making progress in trying to characterize that surface for certain classes of problems, and to me that is the problem, is to, is to get upper and lower bounds on that surface for various classes of problems, um, is to fix the risk, pin it down to say, you know, point, point 0.05 if it's a 0, 1 to loss. Um, and so take a slice through the three-dimensional surface and look at the curve that induces in these other two variables. All right, so that's what we've been doing. Um, now, there are some regimes in these kind of plots that are, of course, well, well known and well understood. If you're a statistician, um, the minimal number of samples you need to achieve some result independent of the procedure is a well-known thing to study. Um, that is minimax theory. And for certain classes of problems, say, you know, linear regression and so on, it's known exactly where that line is, and there are procedures which, know, which are known that uh, arrive at that line. So there are important parts of statistics work at that line. There is a corresponding notion in computer science, which is the minimal runtime you need to solve a problem independent of the size. Uh, you would like lower bounds of that form. Those are harder to come by. It, in some sense, it's, it's a harder problem. Um, so there are some lower bounds known, but there's a big gap between them and the upper bounds in many situations, and they're not known procedures that uh, fill that. But what we care about is not actually those two lines. We care about trade-off curves uh, between runtime and amount of samples and uh, ways to dial, a user can dial up and down that curve um, and, uh, you know, uh, characterize those. Um, okay, so, um, you know, you might be able, if you, know, if you have a small number of samples, you're, you're willing to spend a lot on runtime, 
if you have more samples, you might be able to get by with less runtime to achieve the same statistical risk. That's the kind of thing that one would like to do. Okay, so here's the problem we made finally, you know, we worked on, we, several of us, worked on this for a long time and made no progress, and this is a problem we did make progress on. I think of this as the Bohr atom of statistics. Uh, it's called the denoising problem. Donahoe and Johnston have done wonderful things with it. Um, it's really simple. Um, this part's extremely simple. There's an underlying vector X star, or structure, let's call it, Com not be a combinatorial structure, X star that you'd like to infer. You don't know that, that's the truth. And you have additive noise. Let's make it be Gaussian so let's we can do some analysis. Um, you have additive noise, and you get a noisy observation of X star. Uh, and I'm gonna do that n times, and I got now IAD, noisy observations of X star, and I wanna denoise those observations and recover X star. The only complicated part of the story is that X star comes from a signal set S, which is some combinatorial set, which might be complicated to optimize over or search or, or, or whatever, okay? So that, that will then give us a computationally complex knob to tune is kind of how complex S is. But otherwise, it's totally simple. All right, so how do we start to get an estimator of this? Well, first of all, let's take a sample average of the day, their IAD, so this is a sufficient statistic. And now let's turn it into an optimization problem, a classical thing to do in statistics. It's called M estimation. Uh, you, you take your data Y bar and you try to find a X, which is close to that in some norm, let's use L2, and you look at all X's that are in that underlying sample space or that um, configuration space, okay? So, uh, so now this becomes an optimization problem of an L2 over some set. All right, that can still be NP hard or worse, okay? So, um, uh, so maybe you can't do this. That's the natural estimator. But maybe also for statistical reasons, you don't want to. You might overfit if you try to do this kind of thing. So for both stat statistics and computation, it's natural to relax to an outer bounding set C, which contains S and simpler in some way, okay? Now when you did that, presumably the computational effort went down because it's a simpler set to optimize over, but presumably the statistical risk went up. All right, um, unless there's a been helpful regularization. And we need to sort of characterize all those, those issues. So we need a little geometry to make this little, make a little theory here. Um, and here's our little bit of geometry. So uh, let's suppose our original set S is actually discrete, so we get an integer program. Let's take the simplest convex set which contains it, i.e. the convex hole, C, okay? And now there's a notion of a cone, um, a tangent cone. So for any X star uh, in C, um, sorry, in S, uh, so in this case, one of the points on the, on the, on the corners, uh, there's a set of all directions which locally leave X star and stay inside of C. Uh, that set is called T, this, the, the tangent cone. Oh, okay, so here's the theorem. I mean, this is probably, the, I think it's the last piece of math in the talk, and, but again, it's not hard math. It's just the same kind of things we had before. This is the risk, all right? So here's the truth, and here's our estimator. So this quantifies in an L2 loss the, 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 a notion of loss, and the expectation turns that into a risk. So on the left-hand side, we have just the risk we've been talking about all talk. And then on the right-hand side, what we were able to show is that there is a, a one over n, then there's a factor here, which is not statistics, not computation, just geometry. So this is an expectation over, uh, this has a name, this is called the Gaussian squared complexity. So it's a notion of the complexity of a geometric set from the point of view of Gaussian noise. Um, square weren't this there, it would be very classical. The square makes this a little less classical. Uh, so what is it? It's just you're taking all directions inside the tangent cone, so you're wiggling that, t, that delta around inside of T, right? And you bound the norm, so it's just directions. And you take the inner product between that direction and Gaussian noise, where the Z is random, and that's what that expectation is over, okay? So if I have a small tangent cone, um, I take a given delta, um, then most of the Gaussian noise is kind of close. Right, and so if I take a supremum, uh, here's my supremum, um, then um, I'm gonna get the worst case direction where Gaussian noise perturbs me the most, okay? If I let my tangent cone grow, and then I have more directions delta, all right, and there'll be some direction which might give me even worse perturbation, okay? Because I'm taking a supremum over delta, as the tangent cone grows, this quantity on the right will only grow. So this quantity is by this equation being related to the risk. This is a geometric quantity you can compute. There's no data here. You just try that's a number that depends on the geometry. If you can compute that, that's being related to the risk. So let's now set this left-hand side to a fixed risk, say one without loss of generality, and rearrange the equation. And we see to obtain a risk of at most one, if you can compute this number uh, as a function of the geometry, then if you get that many data points, I will guarantee you a risk at most one. Okay, so we now have a relationship between the statistics the, the number of data points, the thing I talked about earlier, 
and this geometric quantity, which is a Gaussian perturbation across the tangent tones of the, of the set. All right, now, why is that interesting? All right, well, because those same geometric quantities have been related to computational complexity in a long literature uh, where the runtime of algorithms is related to the complexity of the set. So we now have runtime of algorithms related to complexity of set. We have complexity of set related to statistics. We can now get trade-off equations. All right, so the last part of the talk will be setting this up. Um, all right, so here's our original, our, our earlier picture with the S. Here's the convex hole C. And now we're going to look at sequences of these things so we can get, you know, a whole trade-off curve and not just two points, all right? So we're going to look at a nested uh, relaxation, C, C prime, and so on and so forth. And so the tangent cones nest as well. And uh, as the relaxation gets looser and looser, the tangent cone grows, all right? So presumably from a computational point of view, um, as I go down from C to C prime and so on, it, it runs faster. You know, it goes from a semi-definite program to a, you know, second order cone problem to a linear program or something. It, the, the, the set gets simpler and, and the algorithms will run faster, all right? But as I loosened it up, the tangent cone grew and my statistical fluctuations are now worse and now my risk will go up. So I'm getting this trade-off. All right, now, so the last part then is can we quantify this? Um, and so here's what we're going to do. We're going to use known existing hierarchies. You know, Lasserre is probably the most famous one. We're semi-definite, but there's a whole bunch of others, which uh, start with a set S and give you a whole sequence of these relaxations, and they've been widely studied by combinatorialists and computer scientists, uh, giving us this runtime notion. So uh, I will finish now with just a couple of examples. Um, let's suppose the set S was a set of cut matrices. So it's a discrete set. You take a Rademacher variable, just ones and minus ones, and you take an outer product of that, so it's a rank one matrix. Uh, think of a graph in which some of the nodes are colored blue and the others are, are red, and you got a one and minus one, and, and so that defines a cut of the graph. And there is some known cut, which I'm gonna reveal to you by giving you data from my graph. And you wanna infer the true cut. That's a statistics problem. All right, so optimizing over that is known to be intractable. If you relax to the convex hull of that, that has a name, it's called the cut polytope, and there is a known algorithm which runs in super polynomial time in P. P is the, is the total number of degrees of freedom of this set. So this is a square root P by square root P matrix. That's what P is. Uh, if you relax further to the elliptope, there's a known algorithm that runs in this amount of time, and if you relax further to the nuclear known ball, there's that algorithm. So that column, just you bar we borrowed straight from the computer science literature, and here's the new column which if you now calculate the Gaussian complexity for these relaxations, they will of course go get worse as you go down because the risk, you know, the, the tangent cones are growing. But it turns out they get risk, they get worse only in the constant, the leading constant. The leading constant gets worse. This, the complexity of the problem actually doesn't get worse. So this suggests that for statistics point of view, it's much preferable to be down here in these very simple relaxations and not so preferable to be high up because um, the risk doesn't change that much and you know, they run much faster, okay? All right. I got four examples. I think I'm going to skip over two of them and just go to the, the last one here. Um, here's one on network inference where, again, there's computational known results. And the statistics results, again, it's only in the constant, which things get worse as you go down the relaxations. Um, here is a sparse PCA or, or a planted clique problem, computational results. Here it turns out the statistical risk does get a, it goes from P to the one fourth to the P to the one half as you go down. Um, so you might prefer to stay at the more complicated algorithm longer as data accrue here. Um, and then here's my favorite, my last example is, is this one, which is um, a high dimensional inference problem. Let's suppose that I have um, got um, uh, n data points, but my dimension of the space is P is larger than n, kind of the classical modern uh, high dimensional setting. And I'm trying to estimate the covariance matrix, which is P squared. So I have hopelessly too few data to estimate P squared entries if I have you know, only N data points and N is less than P. All right, so people in that setting say, well, what's the best you can possibly do? You can have to set most of the entries of the covariance matrix to zero. So they look at banding estimators where you set the you know, tri-diagonal band to something statistical and then everything else is zero. Well, you can only do that if you know how to order the variables, like it's a time series, say. Uh, if these are like variables in a biological network, uh, you know, kinase relationship, you know, chain or something, you don't know what the right ordering of the variables is. So the inference problem there becomes order the variables in the right way such that banding is a reasonable thing to do. Okay, so you can set that up then as the inference problem is you range over the signal set S where there's a, a, a tridiagonal matrix and then a permutation matrix and you want to infer the permutation matrix. All right, so unbelievably perhaps that's already been studied in computer science. There are known relaxations and running times for this problem. Um, and then the statistical result again is that it only varies in the constant. Um, 
Okay, so that's the end of the uh, examples. Let me just summarize. Um, so, uh, you know, there are some theoretical computer scientists in the room who can probably uh, correct me, but um, my sense is that in the TCS community that uh, the algorithms high up in these hierarchies uh, are preferred because they have much better worst case approximation ratio. As you go down, the worst case approximation ratio gets much worse. And so there's been a lot of work high up in these hierarchies, which is not very practical. Those algorithms are very, very expensive computationally. Uh, from a statistics point of view, the result, the answer is completely different, which is that low down in the hierarchy, you get very high accuracy, nearly as high as you would be in a hierarchy, very much cheaper. So this is kind of a folk wisdom out in the, out in the big data community that really simple algorithms work if you're at really big scale, and this is a theoretical counterpart to that. It, it seems kind of real from this theoretical point of view. Um, and then turning back to the TCS community, I would, my, you know, the, uh, what would we tell them to, to study at this point, um, pretentiously so, uh, is that say, forget about worst case approximation ratios. That's just a geometric quantity, the worst you know, geometric configuration. Who cares about that? I care about the risk, and, and people using data care about the risk, you know, the probability they're gonna make an error on future data. Uh, under that measure, uh, you can now restudy your whole literature and, and, and get different results, and they will be interesting and, and relevant to statisticians. So, um, okay, so that's the end of the talk. Um, I hope my messages have been clear. In fact, Stu's introduction was kind of interesting. Uh, as my career has gone on, I've become far more of a theoretician than I ever was as time has gone on, um, surprisingly so. Um, and it's just because I think that that's kind of where the action is right now, that we have all these new um, environments, new uh, kinds of data, new requirements on data, new architectures, and they've not been looked at from a statistics point of view for the most part. And that is what society is demanding for us to do, take in all this data, make good inferences, and do it in a scalable way. Um, and so and our existing theory just doesn't give us really in much reassurance in that regard. So I think that's really, uh, you know, so a lot of people working in the big data space, if you look at the conferences, there's now dozens of these things, and they're full of thousands of people, and there's just amazing amount of activity. Almost all of its systems work. Um, which is great, you know, building the systems is very important. It's what our society is investing in right now, you know, billions and billions of dollars. Um, it's very, very important, but just doing that and not doing all the mathematical, theoretical, engineering kind of thinking behind that is, is a recipe for a disaster, and I think that, that in academics we're kind of obligated to start thinking this through and try to avoid that disaster and make things, you know, the best for society. Um, so I hope you're convinced that there are conceptual and really mathematical issues that are arising here. And they're brand new, and it's gonna take quite a long time to work them out. So if you're a student, welcome on board. There's lots to do. Um, thank you.
Okay, sure. And I have a lot of students that are um, um, also like uh, thinking the same way and follow the same uh, uh, struggle with the uh, concept, right? So we're going to use the uh, model that the ec economics uh, department used. Uh, we're going to start with questions from a number of graduate students and postdocs that are on the panel, and then the floor will be available to everybody in the other students, other faculty. So uh, let's get started. Um, okay, so, sorry, one of the themes I sort of took away among many from the talk is uh, in the first half you're looking at sort of an L infinity worst case analysis and, and towards the end you're looking more at an average case analysis and I wonder, um, you know, there's lots of methods like for instance the simplex method, we would never use it under a worst case analysis. It's but we know it works well, and it was only the average case analysis by Spielman that came after to sort of justify that. I wonder if you look back at the computation under different constraints under an average case analysis, does that sort of, um, do, you th do you expect to get better results, or do you expect to that uh, some practical approaches were eliminated under a worst case analysis? Okay, yeah, well, if the question's gonna be that good, I'm in trouble. Um, uh, great question. Um, so let me just clarify a little bit, which is that a risk function, of course, has got a loss function, and then it's got this thing, you know, the, uh, add, that we added after, which, which is the supremum, right? Um, if the loss function is L infinity, you're making kind of a very worst case kind of loss, right? So you're being very stringent in your loss. Um, you don't have to do that. I was kind of arguing in my uh, introductory remarks that that's often an appropriate thing to do in many problems. But like false discovery rates is a kind of a loss where you're being a little more forgiving but not super forgiving and there's just a whole bunch of losses. So uh, you should think of statistics as kind of giving you a range of things from which, you know, that are very worst case to not so worst case. And you know, L2 is, uh, is, is not very stringent, for example. All right, okay, all that said, then having done that, there was that supremum outside, yeah. all right? I, you're probably, so, you know, maybe you're referring to that, and probably That's you are, but, but, um, but yeah, so that one is, um, is, is in some sense problematic, let's be honest. Um, and if, if you're Bayesian, what it's doing, it's kind of an objective Bayes kind of thing to do, uh, which is that, um, you know, if I took the, 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 the actual loss function as a function of P and I integrated that under some prior, right? That gives me the Bayesian version of the, the statistical decision theory. It's a, it's a single number where I got it, you know, because I cared about some P's more than others, and I just built that in as a prior. And the worst case is kind of just taking the worst prior. Okay, so it's protecting you against you know, not choosing a very good prior. 
So it's not so bad to argue that. And then if you see in problems like the, the, the denoisy problem, uh, you know, uh, Donahoe and Johnston were able to show you got these extremely useful rates out of this, this assumption. So it looked not so bad for, you know, surprisingly that Minimax is still alive after all these years, mm -hmm. okay? All that said, as we move forward, uh, there is very much a need to get rid of that supremum and not just go fully Bayesian, where you just leave it up to the user to put in their own prior and then integrate over it. Um, and so I really like this Spielman and Tang kind of framework, the, the, the um, smooth analysis framework. Um, and um, I really think that's very pregnant for possibility to kind of think about that statistical inference problem from that point of view. And I, you know, maybe you're aware of it having been done. I'm not, but I think it's really, really going to be a productive thing to think about going forward. So, great question. Okay, so um, I'm currently working on Bayesian non parametric models, um, and it seems to fit well in some respects with the big data paradigm. Um, it can grow, the parameter space can grow with your data. Uh, my question is why it, it doesn't seem like there isn't much literature as far as Bayesian nonparametrics and big data, and why isn't that the case? That's a, another great question, yeah. So Bayesian nonparametrics, for those of you who are not in the end club here, is, uh, you know, um, is it, it's uh, nonparametrics and statistics, of course, doesn't mean no parameters. It means the kind of the opposite, large, infinite numbers of parameters, open-ended numbers of parameters, because you get more data, the statistical model liberates degrees of freedoms and, and gets richer and richer as you go. And that spirit is, is exactly right for the big data era. Uh, if you start to look at real data uh, at a large scale, you see all these heavy tail things where new phenomena keep emerging in little, in little subgroups you never saw before and so on. And so the Bayesian nonparametric paradigm is perfect for that. And the, the gotcha is that Bayesian methods integrate instead of taking, you know, uh, optimizing. And integration, you know, large high scale dimensional integration seems challenging uh, right now. And so, in fact, my whole talk, I, I do a lot of Bayesian stuff too, was there's no Bayes in it. And it's just because it, it's hard to find algorithms that are scalable, and it's hard to find theoretical guarantees for them that exist. Um, and I, I do not believe that's the end of the, the story. So I believe that uh, well-tailored hierarchical Bayesian models that really are well-matched to the problem domain that spawn off clusters at the right rates and all that, uh, and have a large amount of data, will actually mix much faster than anyone has any right to believe. It just hasn't been tried out. Everyone's doing all this deep learning stuff and, you know, and all that and aren't just trying out really, really large-scale Bayesian non-parametric models that you know, Google and Facebook and so on. Maybe, I'm sure people are, I just aren't even aware as I should be. We're trying and something. You guys are <laughs> trying something. And I, I suspect it's possible, just like with hidden mark models, you, you do once through the database or twice mm -hmm. and you're done, it converged. Like, the theory would never predict it yet. But it, because kind of, if you get a little bit of data that gives you a little bit of power on some parameter, mm -hmm. that feeds over the tied parameter over here but because of the model, and immediately have a very tight prior on whatever little bit of data you have over here. And so there may be much, much more uh, mixing than you might expect. Uh, that's just kind of a wild hope, but I kind of am betting on that as time goes on. Um, Jamie from Department of Biostatistics here. Okay. Um, thank you for your um, very informative and thought-provoking talk. Um, I think we will talk about um, a lot about the curves of di dimensionality. Mm -hmm. um, so what would be um, some blessings of high dimensionality in your opinion? And if they exist, how could statisticians take advantage of these blessings? Okay, yeah, great question. I mean, I, 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 I don't um, work that much on the latest era of high dimensional statistics myself, but mm -hmm. a lot of my friends and colleagues do. Um, and they're kind of two stock answers. One of them is that there is a notion that it really came out of you know, f geometric functional analysis, you know, analyzing Lipschitz functions on spheres kind of, the thing, you know. Um, that these objects amazingly concentrate uh, in high dimensions in such a way that they really simplify as you get to higher and higher dimensions. And so like a range of things that can happen and doesn't grow exponentially, it actually is quite the opposite. It, it, it shrinks and concentrates. Uh, and so that's now well appreciated, even though it, 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 it has a parallel in, in probability theory in terms of the large deviation analysis and so on. Um, but, um, you know, I, if you want, like, you know, Bershin in at Michigan has got very nice lecture notes. And Dovoretsky is a, you know, important figure in this field. If you haven't read about that yet, you should. It's a, it'll, it'll continue to dominate a lot of people's thinking. Um, so there are, there are clear mathematical blessings of dimensionality, and they can and should be exploited. Um, and then tied to that is the notion of sparsity and other some notion that we, you know, just because uh, we had a simple geometry and gave us a blessing, and maybe that's not enough, maybe we, will impose like we we live on a subspace. Uh, we don't know the, you know, the number of coefficients is, uh, that are non-zero is small and so on and so forth. Uh, those two things collaborate, the mathematical analysis of uh, sparsity imposing some, some disease and concentration. Um, 
But that's still very, that's been now 10, 20 years of, in statistics at least, uh, very productive relationship. Um, you know, showing either that there's a blessing or that the, the worst case thing can be mitigated because uh, kind of surprisingly um, it's possible to impose an optimization on sparsity and get make, make it still be a tractable optimization and have and have it capture the instance of that. So I didn't say anything particularly exciting there, but I just uh, uh, cursor dimensionality is still will always be present, but it, but it's kind of been mitigated. Hi, um, I'm Ian Marker from Biosex Department. Um, I think in big data area, there is some transition from hypothesis driven to data driven, like uh, instead of having the model and making a lot of assumptions uh, first, we look at the into the data first. I'm wondering if you can share some thoughts about this. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Thank great you. question. I, I agree, it's very exploratory now and I think that's great and that's exciting. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, visualization technologies are needed to help that kind of process go on and, and, and so on. Um, but any statistical exercise is always a blend of exploratory and model-based. You don't just look at a look at data and have the data express something, because you will see, a, a space, you know, a, you know, you always see patterns that aren't there. Humans are predisposed to that. Uh, fluctuations are present, and 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 you have to control that. So there is no, you know, free exploration kind of thing that is not going to, you know, give you errors. Um, so it's just kind of an ongoing effort to kind of, well, let's develop a procedure which is under certain assumptions not gonna give me too many errors, like false discovery rate is a good example. Let's do some screening. And, and then given that, visualize, think about it, hypothesize, and then continue to work with the data, and then may perhaps go gather new data and explore it and, and, and move towards the confirmatory. Um, and then building software systems that support all those activities is very, very important. That's a lot of ongoing work there. But yeah, be, be very suspicious when someone says, well, the data spoke and I, I, I heard, you know, <laughs> that's just non, that's nonsense. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm Mike Hughes from Computer Science. And I guess I'm, you had a lot of great theoretical results in the talk. Uh, and at, at one point, at least in the, I think, the communication section, uh, the, the results there, you mentioned that you were using just an L2 loss. Yeah. And I'm just wondering how, you know, choosing the loss function is often like the most important part of these problems. And I'm wondering how easy it would be to extend the results to, to other loss functions, whether, whether you're thinking about directions in that space. Uh, yeah, most of those things aren't that hard to, to um, you know, there's kind of, uh, for example, the Gaussian assumption, you can do other things, right. sub-Gaussians and all that. And a lot of these loss functions have local coherent, local similarities. Uh, you do a Taylor expansion on them, they're the same uh, locally. Um, and I don't want to kind of push all this under the rug, but um, uh, typically if you work with the L-infinity, it's kind of the hardest one to work with. If you can mm. do that, you're able to work with some of the others. Um, if you can't, you kind of move off to the simpler ones. Right. Um, you know, so I, I would sort of say that this is kind of just a mathematician's exercise to pick, pick ones that would give you a result that it conveys the idea um, as, as simply as possible. Mm. Um, but then uh, in real life, you want to have it as part of the design procedure. You're going to write down a loss function. Someone will be optimizing, and, and that's it. I should say a lot of this, is, this was a real theoretician's talk. There was a lot of lower bounds in this talk, which is kind of somewhat unusual for machine learning people at least. Um, once you develop the lower bounds, you've done something great to sort of show what you can achieve, but then you've got to find an algorithm that achieves it. You need an upper right. bound, and you need an algorithm that achieves it. And there you're more free to pick losses. Uh, it's, it's now you're looking at a specific problem, not all possible problems. And you pick one and you just spend time optimizing it, even though it was kind of complicated. You just let the computer um, go, go to optimize to that. So um, there you're more free of the choice of the loss. So there is a lack of a in the computer science department. Um, at the beginning of, the to of your talk, uh, you started talking about how um, computer scientists a bit uh, overlooked the, uh, theoretical computer scientists at least, overlooked a bit the concept of risk and statistics. Uh, and at the same time, um, statistics, statisticians didn't look at the problem of um, computational complexity. Now, the computational learning theory community look at it in some sense. and. Um, can you say something about you know how you may think perhaps they didn't go to the heart to the yeah. heart of the questions yeah. perhaps or you know how did they fall short or not? Yeah, that's that's uh, I, 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 if I'm being videotaped, but I think I am. I have to be very careful here. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, but yeah, I think I kind of hedged at that point in the talk, sort of saying, well, in computational complexity, there's no reduction of risk. And I was hedging for the reason you alluded to, that you know, um, you know, Val starting with Valiant et al., there was an attempt to kind of make this bridge. And I, I respect that. There's a lot of work, great work that's gone on there. Um, you know, that said, it was basically, uh, it was uh, what is the statute, I would call it um, empirical process theory, which says that, you know, they, there is a loss, and you say, I want to, you know, achieve a good risk. I want to, you know, uh, have my risk be smaller than epsilon with high probability, you know, that, and that's, that's classical empirical process theory. Stu Giemann was one of the earlier developers who worked on this, and many others, so he's from the 60s and 70s, you know, well before that. And what Valiant added was in polynomial time, okay? Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's, that's important to, to then work that out in, in, some, in some cases and see where that led, and, and it really did have a big impact. Um, it, you know, it turned out there weren't that many things that were learnable in that strong sense in polynomial time. So people sort of said, well, we didn't really mean polynomial time. Forget that part of it. Uh, when they forgot that part of that, then they discovered things like VC dimension and Rademacher complexity. Well, well, that was empirical process theory. That wasn't brought in, to, that wasn't discovered inside of computer science. That was discovered by probabilists and statisticians working and combinatorialists and so on, wor working in these other fields, okay? So, and then the field kind of reoriented itself. Okay, you know, I think a lot of people ingested that fact and that helped socially and culturally for these fields to kind of come work together. Um, you know, but then the field, you know, is just kind of not after gone so much after general arching formalisms, you know. So, and a lot of the work has been on the L, the um, zero one loss. It's all oriented towards classification. And of course, as a statistician, I think that's great. And in fact, I think many statisticians think that statistical learning theory is just uh, classification loss, you know, deepened. It's, it's, a, it's, it's made the statistical literature richer on that particular loss function. And it's because people haven't been focusing on that. They've been focusing on L2 and other things. That was a virile contribution. Um, but you know, as time has gone on, there's this richness culturally of, um, you know, you, you also have papers on matrix factorization from, you know, these matrix completion problems, all the sparsity stuff and all that. So it says that the crossroads are just full of crisscrossing cr things. Um, you know, but that, now we still got at this kind of fundamental, how do we get lower bounds? How do we get computational complexity results that are relevant to statistics? We are not, I don't believe that that set of ideas is as fruitful as it's been, has really touched that problem. Hi, my name's Sam. I study computational biology here. Um, when you were talking about using a parameter alpha to control <coughs> privacy, um, yeah. is there a benefit to having it um, be just like unbounded from zero to infinity? Because when you're talking about um, using the uh, random zero one vectors to decide whether to send a closer or further one, um, you just you just yeah. map it to zero one with like with a logit function. Um, and is that is that like optimal privacy for some value of alpha? Is that just convenient? Uh, yeah, so good question. First of all, uh, yes, the differential privacy literature allows it to go from zero to infinity. Our algorithm was actually, our, our, our analysis was a local one. Uh, I think on that slide there was like let alpha be uh, alpha uh, big O of one. And, and in fact, if you look at the analysis, when, uh, the final result, if you take alpha to infinity, you don't get anything meaningful, right? Um, you know, so uh, that's one part of the answer. The other is that um, in some sense it's just a parameter of convenience. You can prove privacy in terms of that parameter and then you can plug that into the risk. So it, it is one way to express the relationship between a constraint on, on discriminability, you know, pri aka privacy, and the statistical risk. Um, if you prefer some other scale or some other notion, um, you know, you could. It just, I, I, I do admire that literature that, you know, they, they found that that formulation, which is very worst case, you know, is a, a tube unlikely the ratio, and it's for all data sets, you know, x and x prime, um, or, or ones that neighbor, or they're close in a, in a, in a certain metric. Um, so very strong, um, you know, but, but probably, uh, you know, so, so why, is, why is it so strong? Well, if, if I take a data set where you protect my privacy level alpha one, and another data set, I'm also in there, maybe or maybe not, but you protect my privacy level alpha two, anybody who glues the two data gets statistically in any way will protect my privacy level alpha one plus alpha two. All right, so that's an important and, and beautiful result. Um, and most other things that you think about, the ad hoc methods for privacy and even information theoretic ones don't do that. When you join, you can lose your privacy. Um, so that's why, w at least we, I think we were help convinced that we should be working in that framework even though we realize it'll eventually be too strong. But I think we're now m you know, motivated to think about weakenings of it that aren't, don't just give up the baby, just, you know, throw up the baby with the bathwater. Uh, 
Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, in your talk, you focused on what I would call sort of stylized models, like kind of, which makes perfect sense when you're trying to sort of get some of the, the theory in practice. But a, as you yeah. said, you know, we, we really want to think about building interesting, complicated models for big data sets. And in fact, if you have a big data set, you can think about models that are far more expressive and complicated than we ever could have imagined with more moderate sized data sets. And so uh, the question is now, are traditional, there's this traditional paths in statistics and machine learning and model building and model validation and model improvement and so on. And a lot of the standard tools, from my perspective, kind of start to break down when you go have very large data sets. And so do you have thoughts on directions for making progress on, on that side of statistics to this big data regime? Um, yeah, so great question. Um, uh, one way of expressing, I think, one, one path forward is that most large-scale data sets are very heterogeneous. So there's all these subpopulations, and they're occurring in unknown proportions. And so you want your estimators, you want to focus more on what I'm trying to really infer. Am I trying to infer something that goes across the subpopulations, or I want to get one subpopulation, or, to, or I want to just get the proportions? And, and um, um, so I want estimators that I need to, uh, to, to, that are first of all robust to the heterogeneity would be one way of going about it. So it's all these nuisance variables. That's kind of unusual. In classical statistics, there was maybe you know a vector you cared about and a vector of nuisance variables, and they were both small dimension, right? You know, now we can let the, the vector you care about get larger and larger, but I think that the vector, you, the things you don't care about, is way even bigger. And so we need kind of high dimensional analyses where the number of nuisance variables goes even faster to infinity. And I don't think that's a hopeless regime to be in. I think though, there's kind of ways to protect yourself about that. Um, and the actual algorithms themselves may have a kind of a clustering flavor where you peel off things, and um, you know, they may have a lot of robust statistics flavor where you don't let all that convenient stuff hurt you. Um, but that's kind of, to me, a nice area to be thinking about. Um, I mean, what in my group we've been spending a lot of time doing is just kind of the parallelization, the subsampling kind of ideas, the asynchronous distributed processing stuff, and just try to get control on that. Um, so less on the kind of the course of distortions you're referring to. Um, but I know model building, model validation, all those things are still critical. They're just that the ideas we have now aren't immediately applicable, is the way you put it. But they are wrong. And I kind of think if you think about all the, you know, split up all the nuisance variables, we kind of got to think about it uh, fresh. And then what's left is still a core part of the model you care about. You know, I'm trying to offer some service for Eric Sutter, you know, and, and, and all these other people are partly, you know, give me useful data about people like you, but all, all, all kind of useless data that'll hurt me if I try to make that inference. But I, 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 I um, you know, have a well, I can make well-posed inference problems and make, and then I have to do that modeling part of the inference correctly and have control over it and so on. So you don't know about things like false discovery rate and all, that's also a very important thing, thing to know about. You know, so if I have large numbers of hypotheses, um, and I could even have some heterogeneity nowadays, I can control the rate of errors across all of those things. That's kind of uh, one opening door, I think, for statistics in particular. Hi, so uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. Um, my feeling overall is that uh, your overall philosophy is that we need to unify a lot of these aspects of we have complexity theory, we have, you know, as you say, the risks from um, visual decision theory. And uh, in line with Professor Sutter's comments, have you considered incorporating aspects that relate to the complexity of the model, like a la Kolmogorov complexity? So, you know, it's for learning a much more complex model, it seems we would need to account for much more, you know, data, account for that complexity and our ability to analyze and find, you know, to understand what's needed. Um, yeah, good question. Uh, so first of all, I, 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 these minimax risks, uh, the family script P here right. um, is often non-parametric and complicated. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and the tools to analyze those things involve things like hovering numbers and areas of mathematics that allow kind of growths and complexity and control over that. Um, again, Stu was a, was a leader in the early 80s in working on this sort of thing, and it's been a, become a kind of you know very important part of the statistics paradigm is to get control on non-parametric notions of complexity. Mm -hmm. So not going all the way to Kolmogorov complexity, which I, I understand right, does bring you into you know computational issues, but. Um, um, if I, if you were my grad student, I'd say don't do that. Don't, don't, don't bother. 
Yeah. It's, Speaking it's, of which, uh, are you looking for grad students? <laughs> always. <laughs> <laughs> always. Or even our postdocs. So. Okay. Well, I'm not here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, Coleman Goff did many beautiful things. In fact, if I could name some of the figures of that era, you know, the Coleman Goff would be highest on the list for kind of this bridging figure. Right. Uh, he, he created the foundations of probability theory, but he also thought right. about computational complexity. Also, Turing, uh, it's important to remember, especially if you saw the movie lately, um, was, uh, <coughs> you know, created the foundations of computer science, but his, his thesis at Cambridge proved essential limit theorem mm -hmm. in, in a different way. Yeah. It didn't turn out to be different. The Russians had already done it, but. Um, <laughs> You know, so, uh, and then of course von Neumann and Wiener, et cetera. These figures, uh, I don't think would have distinguished between computing and co computational algorithmic thinking right. and inferential thinking it was part and parcel. So they'd be surprised to come back here and say someone said, hey, they gotta be unified. Yeah. Part of why Kolmogorov's name came to mind is because it, he unified, you know, information theory and uh, complexity theory and stuff. Or, you yeah. know, at least through some connection. No, so. he was working hard on that stuff. At the right. end of his life, he was doing wonderful things. I just think, yeah. I, I don't know enough about Kolmogorov complexity, but there's this kind of unknown machine constant that's even worse than a regular complexity right. theory. Yeah. So that's not gonna be, I think, the way to go. That's what physics and medicine are for. Right, right. I don't mean Kolmogorov <laughs> complexity itself. That's a I bit mean, of a problem. <laughs> right, I, obviously, you know. But something of that spirit. Something of the sort where, you the know. The length of a program is somehow relevant right, to right. complexity. I mean, th yes. the feeling that we can do, you know, Linear regression with uh, big data. Yes. You know, that, that should be certainly doable. And but it's n cube, it's p cubed, and right. that's relevant. To, you know, right. Decision trees have a length of computation built into them. Like right. neural nets have a kind of a fast length of computation, and there's layers and so on. So, yes, bringing that notion in, yeah. uh, what kind of an algorithmic number of steps instead of um, you know, complexity in terms of covering numbers, which is what we would mostly focus on, is probably very valuable. Another way of thinking about it is these oracle complexities out of optimization theory. They say something like, your problem is complex if you need this many gradient looks to, s to optimize yeah. the right. function, right? And that's been very productive too. So yes, there's more room for m broader notions of complexity that are not exactly the classical Turing style. Thank you. Rossi Law from Biostatistics. Um, um, as a user of optimization um, sort of theory and tools, I uh, benefit a lot of from those tools you mentioned, and uh, it seems like you're, especially in the last problem, you emphasize a lot of the optimization, but I just want to ask you uh, opinion on whether there are other at alternative tools. For example, there are tools that are mostly described as agonistic tool development that just may not, I mean, for certain of algorithms, they can be linked to optimizing a certain function, but for certain algorithms, they're just purely computational, and of course, there will be problems like early stopping, and for example, greedy algorithm, et cetera, that can solve also related problems that you mentioned, like matrix completion, regression, et cetera. So I yeah, just wonder whether those types of, um, and where certain algorithms, they can also prove, I mean, reasonable <coughs> minimax bounds, et cetera, just curious that what do you think about the perspective for just purely without optimization, thinking of just algorithms, and would that um, bring any hope to the uh, big data era? Thank you. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Great, I'm, I mean, I, I'm an op I'm sort of open to anything kind of person. You know, I mean, the Bayesians don't optimize to the, you know, for, you know they, they integrate. So sampling and Markov chain Monte Carlo, all that is, is, is different. It, it, it's, it's a whole different class of tools. Um, now that said, in my 25 year career, I, I've seen again and again, someone will propose some procedure. It'll be like, take some eigenvector of this or that, or do some random walk, or do you know, some clever procedure. And nine times out of 10, it turns out there's a very nice optimization formulation for it. And once you figure out what that formulation is, you can now analyze it and, and deepen it and broaden it and connect it to other things. So that may not continue on, but it's just been, the, been a fact. Um, and, you know, maybe we've swung too much that direction, but it's been a use very, you know, useful fact. So I don't know what are the class of things you have in mind. Um, you know, non-convex optimization, of course, you know, wild fr frontier. Um, you know, eigenvectors, if you take the maximum minimal eigenvector, that's convex. Anything in between is not, but those are still useful eigenvectors. There are non-convex problems that are, that are, you know, we can solve. Um, but yeah, I don't know how much more to say about, you know, um, about it. Um, ah. So those are supposed to be tough questions, so it's coming. 
Now, just uh, <coughs> so big data, you know, is uh, what is it? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, as a computer scientist, <laughs> we were always looking at big, but what is big? But in a serious way, you see various other sections of the academics or the business world using the terms, and it's almost impossible to discuss because they are very different points of view. You hear nonsense like, um, uh, we're going to replace, now that we have all the data, replace causation by correlation, or some kind of ridiculous things like this and so on. So going back to von Neumann, you know, he said that in order to have a new theory, you need to have a new theorem. Like, when he was 25 years old, he proved this Minimax theorem for game theory. And now we know what game theory, that theorem really captured the essence of the new field. So what would you say um, the new theorems of the era are, maybe we need another 25 years old in this audience to prove it, or if it's proved already, or what would you dream of having some results of this type that will be quintessential in some way for the field. Theorems that express the essence of it. All uh, right. Um, I got the theorem written down right here. I just don't. <laughs> I, oh, I lost it. I had it this morning in the hotel. Oh, man. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I, great question. Um, um, I mean th this talk was, in some, some sense, my rallying cry that such theorems will exist. I, I gave what little prototype thought experiments of what those things should look like. They should be, you know, to me, lower bounds are pretty critical. They, they give you the, the best you can do, and, and they should be lower bounds in that space where there's a statistics axis and a compu computer science axis. Um, if you're going to give meaning to this field of data science, it's got to be that space. <laughs> I don't know what else you mean by it, really, in a academic sense. So I want theorems of the kind we've seen in not just game theory, but in statistical decision theory and in complex complexity theory, but in refer to that three-dimensional space. Um, and so these were kind of exercises to get us started, and I, you know, I'm hoping that they'll open the door to further that kind of work. Um, let me just say, though, that I, we use the word data science at Berkeley, too, and, um, and I don't shy away from it. I mean, I believe this is all just some sound statistics. It's a 300-year-old field of trying to make decisions and do inference from data. And, you know, uh, why should this new era, just because there's more of the data, be suddenly not statistics? It's, it is. Um, and I think this is also the natural direction computer science has been tending toward for quite some time, that the computer has got to be in contact with the outside world. In the outside world, you, you're uncertain, and there's, an un there's a generator of data. And, it's, and So, uh, you know, that's great. Um, the term data science is just a nice umbrella that many people can respond to and say, I'm that. So uh, my favorite example is, you know, a database researcher, of which I have several colleagues at Berkeley who we kind of work together in this thing called the AMP Lab. Um, and uh, they, I, if I ask them, are you a statistician, even by my very broad definition of that, um, you know, they'd say no. And, and, and you know, I'd, I'd argue with them that they really are. There's always some inferential content in any query they write down in any database. But, you know, that's just not their culture. And they, but if I ask, are you a data scientist? Of course they are, yeah, because they move data around all the time, and they could, they got all kinds of beautiful theory of you know, how to move data around and control it. Um, and taking their ideas and bringing it to ours in context, that's fantastic. Um, and, and so the and statisticians, in fact, to somewhat to my surprise, are not are embracing the term mostly. They, they say, yeah, I'm a data scientist. And I always was, but you know, um, but now I'm sure I am. And then many other people embrace it too, who are a little even further beyond. Social scientists, you know, who work with Facebook data say, yeah, I'm a data scientist. I'm not just a... So <laughs> it's, it's having the first time in my 25-year career uh, where almost everybody on a typical academic campus says, this is great. This is the future of my field. Let's get on board. Let's do something together. So far beyond, you know, the core you know, mathematical challenges, which is really great, this sociological, uh, you know, effect is really, really significant to me. And of course, there's real companies out there and real people looking, you know, for guidance in this regard. So, um, first time I think where whole campuses, and you know, can kind of come together. In fact, it's at the level of a campus where it happens. You're not going to have all the fields suddenly merge into one mega conference, right? So it's got to be individual uh, campuses doing things, and that, that to me is great. So the business people, you know, yeah, I don't talk their language uh, either, um, and um, 
so on. But I think it's fantastic that, that, that they're interested suddenly in trying to make inferential statements and do branding and marketing of data and all that. Um, it'll take time, um, but that's I, 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 nothing against that. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, so we talked a, lo a lot about uh, machine learning and big data. So I have a question, um, because in big data, the data is already there for you. Um, so, but in terms of to test a real model or application for real human, yeah. uh, there may be no data at all. And so um, let's say a field of education, and we want to test a model for kids. And actually, it's very hard to design a control study for them because it's a little bit hard to see what feature we can collect from a user study and what kids really express is what they say. So um, in terms of like, let's say building a tutoring system for let's say middle school students and we need a lot of data to make a pedago pedagogical uh, model. So in classical way, there requires like um, tens of years user study and a lot of work to, to do for just build a small data set. So is there any way um, in the future we can try to probably using machine learning to um, get those data? Okay, yeah, great question also. I think I understand. As I hope I can say this is useful. Um, so in applied statistics, you have to think hard and long about the inference you're trying to make and what data is relevant to that and can you collect it. Sometimes it's not possible. In fact, in a kind of classical causal inference setting, in some sense it's not possible because I want to give you the treatment and not give you the treatment and see the difference, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's possible. So you've got to get around that somehow. Um, and so you can kind of try to get around by all kinds of control and, all, and, uh, and so on. And it gets to be heavy, hard to do. And, and feasible. Um, so uh, is there anything in the big data area which will mitigate that? So I'm going to actually push back a little bit on Soren's comment there that so no, yeah, yeah, just collecting huge amounts of data doesn't solve the causal inference problem at all, right? Uh, but if you're, you know, an economist um, or econometrician, what you're often looking to spend a lot of your career doing is looking around for so-called natural experiments, okay? So on one side of the river, uh, you know, Philadelphia, they had a certain change in the law on the other side of the river, they didn't change the law. And the, and the populations are the same. Now, this is not necessarily a good argument, but you know, uh, let's suppose the populations are the same. Um, and now you can observe by that natural experiment, that uncorrelated with the behavior of the people, um, you saw that there was a condition imposed on similar people. Uh, it's different in two cases. And now you can try to make a causal inference. And there's even better, there's really beautiful examples, like you know, depending on what uh, age, uh, around the year, you're, uh, what month you were born, you'll, you'll, you'll get a certain amount of schooling. And you, so you can start, uh, d you know, depending on the month you're born, and you can finish school at age 16 on your birthday, right? So you get a random amount of extra schooling depending on when you were born, month you're born into relative to when you finish. And that's unrelated with any other property of you that's relevant to your education. <coughs> it just happens to be what month you were born in. So suddenly you have a very nice natural experiment that can be interpreted causally. So you could hope, this is just a hope, and, it's, and you, know, you don't want to, say this on videotape, but um, <laughs> is that in lots of big data sets, there'll be more natural experiments sitting out there, just right, right out there for smart, causally oriented econometricians and statisticians to find. Okay. Um, um, just but they, they gotta be really schooled and, and, and careful about doing the matching and doing the thinking through the, the, the issues for that to be reasonable. Um, but I think that that's what, I hope that's what your question is getting at. I think that's very, very important. Because you need causal inferences in many situations and people are again and again not making, you know, you pick up the newspaper, or here's some dietary thing, you look at the actual study, it was not done with causal inference, not randomized experiment, it's nonsense, nine, nine, nine times out of 10. All right, so we gotta get around it, and I, I think that, that the heaviness of the randomized experiments makes you have hope that there's other ways of going. Thank you. Hey, I'm Jane from, uh, Department of Cognitive Science. So um, I have a very um, broad question about the relationship between uh, um, of uh, big data and a human-like uh, processor. Because 
we're talking about like uh, uh, what kind of mechanism we should use to process big data. However, as human being, every individual is processing big data every day, all the time. So I'm just, uh, the, my first question is whether studying cognitive science can help us to, um, uh, to learn how big, big data should be processed. That's my first question. The second question is a related question. I have been uh, having uh, some sense of dilemma about um, uh, cognitive science and using statistical learning uh, method to model human behavior and human cognition. On one hand, we achieved a lot in the p past like uh, decades for uh, writing mathematical models, but on the other hand, we don't know whether those models are true. By true, I mean whether it's really happening in the human's mind. I'm just wondering, in your opinion, what would be the best mathematical model to explain human cognition, and uh, what should we do to achieve that goal, and whether it's plausible? Thank you. Okay, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the previous panel with all the <laughs> questions about multiple universes and all had trouble, or <laughs> challenging <laughs> questions, but this is, this is even worse, so, um, right. Um, so to me, cognitive science and neuroscience is the problem in the next hundred years. You know, it is fantastic to work on, and uh, I don't think we have much of a clue, really, uh, how the mind works, um, or we're groping. I think we're kind of in the pre-Newtonian, pre-whatever, Greek era, you know, we're having very rough intuitive theories about it, and to me, what's really, what I was in it, what was most interesting to me was the experimental paradigm. How do you figure it out? What experiments do you do? I mean, Roger Shepard with the rotating images, you know, that was fantastic to me because he was able to conclusively prove the brain was somehow rotating images and that was a very good methodology. Um, and then the field kind of then got into to be a little too uh, uh, oriented, with, you know, too many fMRI experiments were done, you know, and, and so on. And so it kind of got away from that core methodology and that's been a shame. That's what the field really needs to figure out how you could ever decide whether certain theories are, are reasonable or not. Um, as I've gravitated more towards the kind of foundational mathematical and computational issues, um, it's been helpful for me just to leave behind the fact that human thinking works a certain way. And so, you know, just think about, um, I mean, one of, you know, think about uh, Amazon's recommendation system. You know, isn't that fantastic that you go to Amazon and then you buy a few books and it starts to recommend other books to you, right? Um, that's a change the culture. And if you, if you think about it writ large, you know, if, if, if I could go to the Twitter universe today and sort of see that people would like to have certain kind of books read and I could make that available to authors who would bid on I'll write that kind of book. We have microeconomies built on data analysis. You know, this is really going to transform our, our world, and it's already starting to do it. Um, and that has nothing to do with cognitive science, as far as I can tell. It's like a recommendation or a matrix completion problem. I don't think the brain does that, or the mind does that. I don't think that humans are particularly good at that kind of thing. And so just thinking about the mathematical principles on how to do that, to me, turn, turns out to be very productive and useful. Um, so I think we, we expand the scope of what, you know, early AI was focused on trying to make, you know, humans with artificial uh, mechanisms. And that was way too narrow. And I think the usefulness of Googles and Facebooks of the world is they opened up our minds to all kinds of other problems involving intelligence and algorithms and data and, and so on that, that we don't care whether humans can do it or not. It's still interesting and useful to pursue. Um, then we might get a broader scope of what intelligence is and maybe humans are one of those particular procedures we develop. So I think it's better to current era to do the math and the engineering it all has to go for it. I'm not trying to say no one should start set putting, stop, everyone should stop putting electrodes in brains and, and doing the experimental educational research. But um, I just think this, this, this more mathematical field and computational field has leapt forward in 20 years. It's amazing progress where the other fields are just slower. Hi, I'm Chip Lawrence. Hey, um, I had the pleasure of working for NCBI, one of the early computational biology uh, institutes. And there, we often were confronted with a problem that the data we got really was poor quality. Sure. And we wound up saying, data quality is very important, but who wants to do it? And data quality could be just poor measurement, or it might be something malicious. Like on Fitbit, I'm Indiana Jones, I weigh 300 pounds and I'm four foot two tall. Right. So my question is, okay, we've taken this big data, we've taken it like it is data, but how does the issue of the quality of the data bear on the problems of inference in big data? No, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked the question. I mean, I, I, um, my talk didn't focus on it at all, but of course, 
if you go to any industry taking in data and doing real big data analysis, you know, 90% of their work is that. Um, but if you look at actually what they are doing, uh, you know, they are using statistical principles, right? They're worrying about the bias. They're worrying about the heterogeneity. They're worrying about the sampling frame. They're worrying about all those issues. Um, and so uh, maybe it's not the cutting edge, you know, and, and all, but it's critical and it's not widely enough understood and used. And so really the answer there is just kind of that if more people would get a good classical statistical education uh, on how do you treat missing data, how do you do, imp imp you know, how do you make hierarchical models, how do you get rid of bias and all that, um, that that's, that's really critical. Um, so one of the things I'm doing at Berkeley right this moment is desi helping design a brand new class for f all freshmen that Berkeley would take, which would be statistical inference principles. And a lot of these issues, including causal inference and including noise in data, will be part and parcel of what we're trying to teach. And we're trying to teach it without any equations and like calculus and probability that you, stuff that all of us grew up on. Uh, instead, letting the computer you know, do the work and seeing what happens when you make the wrong, you know, you don't clean up the data the right way and what the inferences are, you know, the inferences are wrong now and so on. Um, so I just think that's a very ongoing, long educational and technological process. And let me just add to the previous question, like in biology, you know, it's just been fantastic hand-in-hand -hand growth with, with our field. You know, thinking about all the data cleaning issues that, you know, like a, like a Terry Speed, a statistician would work on, or a Dean Reed. And, uh, you know, together with how do you bring phylogenetic analysis or genetics together on your, you know, to, to play your inferences. You know, I can learn about the certain, you know, markers for certain diseases because of phylogeny. And again, that's not something the human evolved to do. That's what computers are made to do. Right, and so and there are fantastic issues there about that. So the downstream thing I was caring about was after you do all that processing, you're going to, on the basis of some genetic analysis, predict whether someone has got to have Down syndrome, a baby embryo is got Down syndrome or not, and you're going to deliver that to a real human being sitting, you know, and that happens a hundred thousands of times per day. And uh, so those inferences have got to be somehow under control, not just a hodgepodge. But that means the whole pipeline has got to be under control. So yeah, you gotta build the fr front ends like you're talking about, but use all the right principles and then be honest about your error bars as they percolate all the way up. And if they became huge at the end and useless, be honest about that. So, thanks. So following up the previous question, so my question is about uh, uh, inference with security against uh, adversarial inputs. So I've seen some reports about research on poi poisonous data, uh, specially crafted to corrupt a uh, support vector machine several years ago. And recently there are paper, papers about uh, specially crafted noise added uh, to the input to deep neural nets that can make them uh, uh, produce very high error rates. So my question is that, is the um, uh, security in inference a, a, a valid question that, that is being considered, or is it a non-issue given big data? Uh, or what do you think about that? Uh, no, it's a great question. Um, I do have some knowledge of colleagues who work on that set of questions. It's definitely an area, and uh, it's not one I've worked on at all, so I, I don't know much about it. Um, when I first started hearing people talking about it, I said, well, first thing you need to learn how to do is learn about robust statistics, first of all, you know, so don't calculate the mean, calculate the median if you think someone out there is throwing in bad data. And, and just take robust statistics as ser more serious as a field. And I think that's another ongoing thing, effort, is to make people more aware of that. Of course, that, and that will help, uh, you know, some of these issues. Um, but it doesn't solve them, and a, a determined adversary will get around those. Um, and so, yes, that's a fantastic area where more research is needed, and it's exactly the, get a statistician and a crypto, crypto person in the same room and make them work together, I suspect that would, you know, uh, good, good things will happen and it's really gonna be necessary. I mean, yes, we, in 50 years we will have a society where you know, data is flowing everywhere through all the tubes you know, and every one of our decisions will be made on some kind of data analysis and bad people will be in, in, you know, putting in bad data and trying to corrupt that system. Um, just like they try to corrupt all our existing you know, infrastructure. So it'll be, you know, I hate to say this, you know, this is not the field part I care about the most, but having the, 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 night, the security guards and the policemen in the modern data-oriented e economy will be necessary, sadly. Um, so, yeah, 
definitely should be people should be working on it now. Uh, so one thing that came to mind, like uh, both during your talk and answering a uh, question, uh, maybe two questions ago, talking about the, uh, needing end-to-end -end assurance of you know, the quality of your computation, um, is it seems like there's a lot of analogies between designing algorithms intended to manage statistical risk uh, and designing uh, algorithms for, you know, in the numerical methods context where you need to, you know, manage, you know, bits of precision. And it's, you know, sort in some sense a dual problem. Um, mm -hmm. But it seems like maybe there's can be inspiration in how s statisticians and computer scientists can collaborate in the same way that, you know, applied math and computer science people have collaborated in the past. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Great, great point. No, I, don't, I don't think it adds to what you just said. But yeah, backward error analysis in linear algebra had a big impact on a lot of people. And I think my, my field has been kind of affected by it. We, we view it as pretty important. Um, and and by the end-to-end -end error propagation kind of issues and all that. Um, so yeah, I think it just, I think most of us take it as an inspiration. It does, and sometimes it immediately gives you methods. Uh, you know, so if someone proposes a new matrix completion factorization procedure, and they haven't done any error analysis, uh, you know, you call, hold your nose until they do it, because you, you know, it's probably gonna blow up numerically, and a lot of us are aware of that. So, so that's been really healthy for the field, and the theory is kind of interesting, but, uh, but it, it, you know, uh, numerical linear algebra definitely doesn't touch all the things, the, the paradigm that we're interested in. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, very Hilbert space oriented. It's not where we are typically. But, but yeah, great point.